I'm pleased to welcome you to our second webinar of the 22-23 academic year. Uh, this is primarily for early career researchers and mid-career researchers. Uh, just to note that thanks from funding from HEFCU, the Society has been able to start this research and development program. Our ECR network is one strand of this work, and we believe our network adds value because it's pan whales and cross-disciplinary. Uh, we want to give ECRs, early career researchers and mid-career researchers, the opportunity to connect beyond their institutions and, of course, with the experience of our fellows. Um, just to note, we're also uh, going to be organizing a conference for early career researchers in Swansea on the 6th of July, 2023. And we hope that uh, there'll be more information, but we hope that you guys will be able to attend. Uh, today, we have some really excellent speakers who will be addressing the topic of international collaborations. How we establish collaborations has uh, been changing post pandemic. So discussing some of the challenges and considering new ways to produce knowledge across cultures is really of utmost importance to research. And that's particularly as we look at a globally responsible Wales under the Future Generations Act. So we're delighted to have some excellent speakers to deliver the event, knowledge production across borders, insight and opportunities. And thanks to the audience uh, for being here today and for uh, actively participating in the sessions later on when we'll have some Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our fellows who's going to chair today's session. Professor Elena Miguelez Cabiera is professor in Hispanic studies at Bangor University. As she's the author of the book, Galicia, a sentimental nation, gender, culture, and politics, and is the editor of A Companion to Galatian Culture. She has published extensively on post-1850 Iberian cultures and translation studies. With Ang Harrod Price and Judith Kaufman, she co-edited co the special issue of the Journal of Translation Studies entitled Translation in Wales, History, Theory and Approaches. And she's the director of the Centre for Galician Studies in Wales, established at Bangor University since 2006. Proiso y Professor Elena, please take it away. Thank you very much, Kathy and Barbara. Thank you all. Croeso Guinness y Baub. It is a real pleasure for me uh, to chair this event. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for uh, for reaching out and uh, for um, asking me to, um, to to take care of this. It is a really exciting uh, event. We have a great uh, program uh, ahead. Uh, the title, as Cathy has just said, of our panel discussion, discussion today is Knowledge Production Across Borders, Insights and Opportunities. This is a topic that very much cuts to the goes to the core of what we do as researchers working on the intercultural uh, 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 line of work. Uh, some of us also work with uh, with communities uh, that have endured, for instance, processes of uh, dispossession historically, uh, indigenous communities, whether that is uh, related to linguistic rights, to political rights, to uh, access to resources. So uh, a lot of ethical questions uh, emerge when we go about our uh, our work, uh, uh, whether that is in our uh, research methods, whether that is in the way we communicate our work, in the way we teach our work. So uh, this panel is uh, hugely important and I am very, uh, uh, very grateful uh, to the Early Career Researchers Network of the Learned Society of Wales for uh, for putting it together and for bringing us uh, together uh, for this uh, event. I'm going to um, uh, tell you a little bit about how the uh, event will be structured. Uh, we're going to have uh, three parts, if that's okay with uh, you all. Uh, the first uh, will be a talk uh, by Susie Bentris Fields, who is the uh, Chief Executive of the Welsh Centre for International uh, Affairs. Uh, Susie can only be here, uh, can only be, um, um, can only attend the panel for this uh, uh, early part. So we're very grateful for her time today for her uh, insights. Then after that, we will go into uh, the discussion panel where our three speakers today uh, will uh, will um, will discuss uh, aspects of their of their research and of their uh, experience. 
uh, that's uh, uh, going to be Dr. Geraldine uh, Lublin, uh, Dr. Antonio uh, Yoris, and Dr. Lucy Atala. I will introduce them uh, in a greater uh, detail later on in due course. And then after they, they, they speak, we will have the third part of today's session, which is going to be devoted to your questions to the colloquium, if you if you like. So as Cathy uh, said, uh, you're very welcome to ask any questions uh, after our three panelists have spoken, and you may use uh, uh, the, um, the speaking function, the camera, or uh, the chat, as Cathy said. So without further ado, if it's um, okay with you, I will introduce you to Sue uh, Ventris Field, who, uh, as I said, is the chief executive of the Welsh Centre for International Affairs. Uh, with a passion for involving people in internationalism, Susie leads the Welsh Centre for International Affairs and has been involved in the organization since um uh, uh, since being a volunteer in it in 2013 her career in the third sector has included work in gender equality education and inclusion in wales england south korea and eritrea and eastern africa so without further ado susie the floor is yours and thank you very much for your time today um, okay, so thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'm the um, I'm the non academic imposter for today. Um, and I um, just wanted to um, give a bit of a framework for the discussion around um, knowledge exchange focused on this idea of a globally responsible international partnership or partnerships. Um, and just what I mean by partnership in this context is everything from um, working on a project together across borders through to um, a, a long term institutional partnership. So covering all kinds of, of partnership at all levels and between all sort of ages as well. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just briefly introduce um, the organisation I work for to say a little bit about what we do to give a bit of context. Um, and then I want to just uh, describe the kind of globally responsible frame for international partnerships and what we mean by that. And then I'm going to share some ingredients of um, from our experience what we think make successful partnerships and the kind of um, skills and competences individuals need to kind of um, be involved in those successful knowledge exchanges and partnerships. Um, a lot of the things that I'm going to share in my presentation, um, looking at the speakers later today, they'll be going into more depth, really in detail case studies focused on research. Um, but hopefully this will give a bit of a framework for that for that discussion. OK, so um, very quickly, first of all, um, the Welsh Centre for International Affairs is a charity. We're based in Wales um, and we inspire people in Wales to learn about and to take action on global issues, global issues, anything from climate change to migration to conflict, um, all the big issues that affect us all around the world. Um, our hope is that one day everybody in Wales will contribute to creating a fairer and more peaceful and more sustainable world. Um, so another way I like to think of our work is we, we want a Wales of active global citizens, all of whom are contributing to creating a globally responsible Wales and protecting the well-being of current and future generations in Wales and around the world. Um, so what does this mean in terms of our work on global partnerships? So um, we do a lot of work in partnership with organisations around the world. We're one of the leading organisations in Wales, delivering volunteer exchanges from individual to group exchanges at all ages. Um, this depends on us having strong partners all over the world, because although the volunteers might change year on year, we work in long term partnerships with the people who we send volunteers to and who receive volunteers from as well. Um, we do and have done a lot of training in building successful and sustainable and equitable partnerships and we've done particularly a lot of training for schools um, when they've been, they've been building new partnerships and institutional, institutional partnerships around the world. Um, WCI is the host of the Hub Cymru Africa Partnership, um, which supports Wales Africa um, partnerships, particularly global solidarity and international development partnerships between Wales and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Wales has a new international exchange programme called Tithe, and we are supporting the youth sector in particular 
in their tithe programs um, and kind of as part of this we we're very involved in a kind of tr training and professional learning cycle around international exchange so everything from making sure there's excellent pre-departure training for everyone involved in either a physical or a virtual exchange through to making sure when people return from exchange can pause reflect and review um, on their experience um, so I think sort of the key factor to draw out of this is that all of our partnerships are really based in a strong set of values that are rooted in equity and um, making sure that there's really strong safeguarding um, and also making sure that uh, solidarity is the kind of foundation of the partnership. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Um, so just quickly before I, I go into the ingredients of successful partnership, um, we kind of place all of our um, partnerships into this sort of frame of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And Cathy mentioned earlier, we've got the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales, which is really all about protecting the well-being of current and future generations. It's a piece of legislation for sustainability, essentially. And one of the goals is this idea of globally responsible, being a globally responsible nation that makes a positive contribution towards the rest of the world. And so for us, the absolute starting point for that is doing no harm to the rest of the world. So that means thinking about the four dimensions of well-being. So that's cultural, economic, social and environmental. And so, you know, we know from our experience that partnerships can be extremely positive, but there is also the potential for harm. And I'll, I'll cover a couple of examples in a moment. But this idea of globally responsible Wales and being globally responsible means that all our, our partnerships are rooted in this idea of do no harm through to having a positive impact. And we've done quite a lot of work with the um, sector, uh, with the international sector in Wales to co-produce a kind of a vision for what it means to be globally responsible. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this in detail because a lot of it's not relevant today, but I wanted to just zoom in onto a couple of points which are relevant. Um, and so as a sector, we really feel that to have this kind of globally responsible approach embedded in everything we do, it's really important that our international partnerships and international relationships are rooted in anti-racism, in good safeguarding, in mutual respect and good partnership practice, that we're avoiding stereotypes in our communications about international partnerships, um, that we've got a really open approach to knowledge and expertise exchange, so really open source exchange, um, and that we're really looking at mutual sharing of skills and benefits between our international partnerships. Um, so whenever I'm talking about partnerships, I'm always thinking in that frame of a globally responsible Wales and how we're making a contribution. OK, so um, I'm going to come now to some of these ingredients. Now, I want to say at first, these aren't rocket science. And many of you who have worked internationally will already know these and already be working in this frame. But one of the things that sometimes surprises me is that Although these are fairly um, common sense ingredients of a successful partnership, we do still see a lot of them absent. So um, often when people are engaging in international exchange and international partnerships for the first time, we still often see a real uh, charity mindset or colonial attitudes from the UK side. Um, we also see extractive partnerships and we also see sometimes types of expertise and knowledge being valued over others. Um, and so I, I should say as well, this is, and I'm going to come back to this on the next slide, it's also about a personal learning journey because I've been working in partnerships um, and working internationally for my entire career, but there's still a constant process of challenging yourself not to value those things that you are most familiar with, not to value the cultural experiences and um, methodologies that are most comfortable to you over those that you might find in another country or another culture that you're working with. So even though I'm sharing these ingredients, I, I want to say that it's constant work as an individual and as a partnership to keep these embedded. So first ingredient, um, really obvious one but shared and realistic expectations so whatever the project you're working on um, having a really honest assessment of resources available um, one of the quickest ways to, to, to destroy trust in a partnership is to promise more than can be delivered um, and what's really best is developing those expectations together 
from the beginning of the partnership? What is it you want to achieve together? What's the shared purpose of the project or the partnership? And how are you going to keep on track towards that? And the more co-production you can embed in that process of developing your expectations, the better. Um, and part of getting that started um, is really that open knowledge exchange of so sharing research methods, methodologies, sharing resources and really thinking about simple things like the languages, you know, the translation of resources, making sure that everything you, you're working in is accessible. Um, and I mean, this comes down, I mean, to the probably one of the biggest theme is this aware, awareness and the importance of mutual partnership, um, equity and the awareness of, of power and privilege. Um, I know a lot of the other speakers are going to be talking about power dynamics um, in more detail. Um, but there's a really important aspect of recognizing the power and privilege dynamics within the partnership. If one partner has more resource, it will create an uneven power dynamic. It, you know, and it's about acknowledging that and recognizing that and discussing how to put checks and balances on that. Um, it's also about seeing how each partner can bring their strengths to raise the profile and voice of the other partner. There's been some really nice work um, with between Size of Wales and some of their partnerships with indigenous communities in South America, and also the Youth Climate Ambassadors in Wales, particularly around COP26 and COP27, where they've given their, um, their passes to COP27, for example, to indigenous communities, or where they've chosen to share platforms that they've secured at these sort of prestigious events that are quite difficult to get places that they've shared or given their platforms to others who would, would really benefit from that voice. So really thinking about how you can use the power dynamic to the advantage of each, other's, of each other. Um, and then there's another point within the power dynamic that I think often gets missed, which is to be conscious of the power dynamics in the communities you're working within. So, I mean, we all know it in our own institutions, some people have more power than others, some people are more excluded than others. Those dynamics are the same everywhere, but you might not recognize the power dynamics if you're working in a new context. So taking time to get to know that. Um, another really obvious point I think that really important is that kind of collective and co-producing methodology with regards to planning the work you're going to do, taking action together, but then reviewing the partnerships and reviewing the action and reviewing how things are going. Um, there's some really strong school partnerships in Wales and the reason that they're strong is they use really um, excellent technological approaches, especially since COVID, to make sure that they can co-produce um, and plan together. And they're really successful partnerships because there's a real valuing of the expertise and knowledge on both sides of the relationship, rather than it feeling like a one way, a one way street. Um, I put this, I'm, I'm going to come back to it a bit later, but the partnership and training and learning cycle, I think, is really important. Um, I mentioned that we deliver schools training for, for successful partnerships and the approach we delivered that on behalf of the British Council and the approach used to be to train teachers in Wales before they went on an international exchange or built a partnership with partners around the world. Um, during COVID, because we moved everything online, we shifted the dynamic and did the training for all of the participants in the partnership together. And the difference was so powerful because instead of supporting Welsh teachers to understand the intercultural dimension to think about their own stereotypes, we did that across the partnership. And it was really, really enjoyable actually, but really important to see um, the teachers here in Wales understanding the preconceptions their partners had of them and also having opportunities to challenge those stereotypes that mutuality right from the training cycle is really valuable um I've put in embedding anti-racist principles you know I think um I've mentioned it before but you know that this sort of tendency to have a charity mindset or a colonial attitude um it's really embedded in some of the um, some of the communications we receive about certain parts of the world. So it does take a constant challenge of that and making sure that you value those different kinds of knowledge. Um, it obviously depends on the relationship and the partnership, but the um, the long term relationships are, cer are certainly stronger partnerships. So as I said before, even where we might have a volunteer who's on a relatively short exchange. There's an institutional relationship sat behind that with, with the uh, communities or the organizations that we're working with. 
which means that there's a sort of understanding of each other. We can share honestly any challenges or problems. Um, and, and that is also important with regards to distributed leadership. So if one person holds a partnership and that person goes somewhere else, the whole thing can fall apart. So it's really important to involve on both sides, lots of different members of a community or an institution in a partnership. Um, and I'm also going to just draw a particular attention to safeguarding. Um, because I'm working in the international development and global solidarity sector, some of you may know there was quite a big safeguarding scandal some years ago. Um, and now we're working more in the international exchange sector. What I've noticed is that when we talk about safeguarding, there's a couple of focuses. One of the focuses is on the safeguarding of the individual traveling somewhere from here. That is important, but it's equally important to consider the safeguarding processes and practices for the communities that are being worked within. And it goes beyond just the ethical dimension of the research itself. This is about personal behaviors whilst overseas. This is about making sure that you understand that your behavior in another country can cause harm and understanding how not to do that. And so I think safeguarding is really essential part of, of any kind of partnership relationship. Um, and then just on my last, last slide before I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Um, one of the things that um, we as WCIA think is really important and we do a lot of focus on is um, preparing individuals for partnerships. So we've talked a little bit on the previous slide about those ingredients of sex successful partnerships, but it's really the individuals and the individual competences that make those partnerships work. Um, so we frame this around education for sustainable development global citizenship or ESDGC so the competencies of being a global citizen um, there's lots of those and I'm not going to go through all of them they do include things like an awareness of power and privilege which we've talked about before um, anti-racist approaches um, but I wanted to draw out a couple here so intercultural competencies sometimes there's an assumption that you develop intercultural competencies by being in an intercultural space and I don't believe that that is the case. We live in a multicultural society, yet many of us do not have intercultural competences. I've seen a large number of people engaged in international partnerships and overseas trips where they travel and they find people from their own country and spend all of those time with those people because they are nervous or not confident in developing those competences. So it takes work and it takes effort and it often takes some um, some facilitation and some overcoming of language barriers, but that intercultural competency isn't, isn't developed naturally by just being in a new culture. So it is really important to think about that skill. If you're traveling yourself to think about how you develop that and how you can build your confidence in that area. You can draw upon the, you know, as we say, we, you know, we, there's lots of intercultural spaces you can get involved in. In the UK, you don't have to travel to get that experience and that competency, especially within our universities. There's a personal journey about engaging with your own power assumptions and privileges, which never stops. And I would say that's the same for me. Every time I'm engaging with partnerships, you make assumptions, you stereotype, you challenge back, you think about your practice. And it's a long term journey and it doesn't really end, but it's keeping that in your mind. Um, and also, again, on both sides of the partnership, there will be assumptions that will be kind of a, you know, a challenge and, and something that you'll continue to work on. My favourite approach and my favourite idea around approaching partnerships is this idea of curiosity. Um, we can sometimes have a, a tendency to go in with a problem solving approach when we're in a new situation, but actually using appreciative inquiry, uh, looking for the strengths, looking for the ideas. Oh, so they do something in a different way. What's good about that? Why does that work? And how can we look at those methods? How can we look at those methodologies and different ways of sharing knowledge and experience and valuing those? So I think that um, that curiosity is one of the most fundamental principles of engaging in a success, successful partnership. Um, again, it's really it sounds really obvious, but the time to build relationships, it's never wasted and it takes more time than you planned for. And that's a good thing. It's never wasted time to build strong relationships, to learn about each other um, and not to go straight into the research, not to go straight into the work. And this leads back into the idea of realistic expectations. We often see individuals who are engaging in international programs have very high levels of ambition for what they want to achieve in a relatively short amount of time. 
And actually, because you do need to spend time to build new relationships, to value new kinds of knowledge, to understand those new kinds of knowledge, it often takes a lot longer than you might expect. So, you know, toning down expectations can sometimes be really positive. Um, so not thinking you're going to achieve everything very quickly. Um, and then just the last point I'll make before before I take any any questions is is this idea of um, one of the things we've noticed, especially since COVID, is that people are really nervous about traveling again and building relationships. Um, we're much more conf confident on the virtual side, which is really positive um, for, for collaboration, but where there is a physical exchange element involved and people are traveling, often there's a need for sort of very, a lot more handholding or a lot more practical help than we've seen before. And just sort of to acknowledge that that's fine and that some people will need more practical support before they engage in a physical exchange or travel um, is again on both sides of a partnership. So where people are traveling in both directions, sometimes it takes a little more handholding than might be expected. Um, I think Kathy mentioned it at the beginning, so much of international exchange can now be done and partnership building can be done online, which is fantastic. Um, but it's just remembering that some of those competencies are the same. And sometimes when we're in an online space, we rush to the agenda, let's get through the items we need to cover. And we skip some of that vital point of time to get to know each other, time to build relationships. So remembering that if the partnership is online, to still take the time to take those steps to get to know each other, to share knowledge, to share information before you get down to the, the, the business or the work that you're trying to achieve. Um, and ultimately, the hope is that every research partnership or relationship in Wales sits within that globally responsible frame of being really based in values, really contributing positively to both sides of the partnership. OK, so I will stop there. Um, happy to take questions. Jochen Bauer. I'll stop sharing screens. Uh, there we go. Fabulous. I think I'm on time, Eleanor. <laughs> yes, perfectly on time. Many thanks, Susie. So are there any questions that you'd like to ask? So looking at the chat as well. Well, yep, yeah. Lucy, yep. Yeah. This isn't so much a question. This is just a Great work you're doing. I'm so pleased. There have been so many times when I have, so as an anthropologist, obviously I spend time uh, uh, around the world and um, on what we call field sites. And um, often that's been with indigenous populations or small scale cultures of some kind, often uh, very remote rural centers. And somebody from a charity rocks up and decides everybody needs something. Um, and this has happened countless times. I think, I don't know how much international development money has been wasted on this. Uh, not that money wasting is my biggest problem. The biggest problem is the mindset that people arrive with. Like all of these women in this small scale culture need to be educated is something that is very, um, exercised abroad by let me just say it lots of white people um and of course these i mean i've sat with these women after they've been educated and they're in hysterics laughing at how stupid we all are but that's what's education so i, I know a group of women who sat and sang the alphabet for hours and then got paid a bit of money and thought well that's easy now I can go and buy some maize <laughs> you know <laughs> so um it it yeah I'm so pleased to hear you say to have heard you say some of the things that you've said this is something that anthropology has been bleating on about for ages you know and it's really heartening to hear that this is being um explained in good detail to people so bloody well done Thank you, Lucy. I mean, it's a subject of passion and it comes from my own learning journey. You know, I started at 18 on an international exchange trip, which I frankly shouldn't have been doing. You know, I didn't realise at the time. And you you reflect on these things and you learn. But I think the sector, the international development sector is catching up with that way of thinking, but it's still yeah. got a long way to go. 
Um, we like to really focus, because of the global solidarity element of Wales and the idea that it's rooted in partnership, really trying to support those partnerships to be much more equitable. And I think, you know, we're getting there. It's still a long way to go. But um, yeah, it feels so important. And I, I, I couldn't agree more, you know, that the, if we think about the work we're trying to do around future generations and you look at the approach of some indigenous communities around intergenerational thinking that's where we need to be it's not about it's, it's, it's the knowledge needs to be coming the other way you know and we need to really be valuing that um i was just i was just looking actually there's a couple of questions come up in the um in the chat one of which was about language barriers i think this is so important because I'm monolingual, sadly. I speak some other languages not brilliantly, but not well enough. So most of the work I've done in partnership has, has been, um, you know, I've been speaking English. And I think it's an issue because it's a power dynamic issue again. So, you know, when I was in Eritrea, I did learn quite a lot of the, the two local languages so I could operate reasonably well. But I think it's you know making sure you've got translation facilities and maybe you know, the first language that you're working in is not your language, is not English. It's the language of the community, and you've got a translator for you, and that just immediately flips the language, the, the power dynamic, rather than <laughs> operating in your language and having a translator for someone else. I think that's you know those are the sorts of things that you need to be thinking about, and 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 you get there, you know, using pictures, using gestures, and again, it comes back to the getting to know people, spending time sitting with your own challenge that you can't understand what's happening and enjoying it and starting to learn um that that, that for me is is part of the pleasure of, of of internationalism and being engaged in international relationships is you know mutually puzzling your way through meaning together um is really fun <laughs> and you learn so much um i'm just looking in the questions as well there's one there about um being in wales makes it different to some of those attitudes I'm going to say yes and no. So I'd say institutionally in Wales, the way Wales work, Wales has got kind of quite a long history of solidarity in particular, um, not just around global solidarity, but around peace building. Um, there is um, there is legislation that supports this way of thinking. The Welsh government's current approach is seeking to embed an anti-racist approach. On the other hand, if we look at the Welsh population as a whole, there's still plenty of colonial and racist attitudes. There's still plenty of charity mindset. So I think there's a better framework in Wales to promote this way of working, but it still needs the skills, the global citizenship skills, as I think of them at the individual level. Um, it's much easier in Wales because in England, it's almost driven by extractive partnership building at a governmental level at the moment, which makes it very difficult to work in the broader UK context, at least in the Wales context, we can use the act, we can use this concept of global responsibility, we can use these sort of anti-racist ambitions of the Welsh government to frame our approaches in a sort of collective way, but there's still plenty of work to be done in that space and you still see plenty of not great practice as well. Great. Uh, we still have four or five more minutes for questions before we move on to the next part. Um, I, I, I have a question, if I if I may abuse my role as chair. You mentioned, Susie, the, uh, the role of, of translation when you were uh, discussing this issue of language. We have a, an MA in translation studies at Bangor University, and we often actually look at the the role of translation in sort of humanitarian crisis situations and how tricky it can be actually to, to sort of to, to get it right. So I wonder whether you could let us know a little bit more about, you know, what, how do you outsource translators or are, are they sort of em embedded in the in the organization? How do you seek out that that um, that that support? So for us, I mean, a lot of because a lot of the work we do is in supporting partnerships rather than we do hold partnerships ourselves. But it's more about this advice. So we we would kind of more advise than 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 provide that. But I think you know I, I think about some of the work we've been doing with Academy Wales uh, Wales Peace Institute um, and sorry Academy has a Wales Peace, the, the Wales Peace Institute and trying to 
do multilingual events and bring in translators from so if we're working with a partner um, overseas we ask them if they can provide a translator rather than having a bank of translators ourselves um, and then we would do multilingual events some English some Welsh some of the different languages so that it feels like the language exchange is, and it's an exchange is very much part of the experience. I think in humanitarian context, it's really challenging because of the speed. And sometimes there is a practical imperative to using the most common language to just get things across. But then the role of just translating content. I mean, we did a lot of work in COVID or Hub Cymru Africa did translating COVID information for partner countries because that was what was being requested by partners on the ground which is like good quality, easy visual translated content into lots of languages. So sometimes, you know, the speed dictates some of the languages, but making sure that translation is there. Yeah. I, I laugh a little bit about this because um, my husband's from Eritrea and I always see this power dynamic played out because he always complains that we argue in English and that that means he nearly always loses because he he can't think quite as fast in English as he does in Tigrinya. So um, I, I always, you know, I think, you know, those those individual relationships we have, it's the same thing playing out at an institutional level, those power dynamics are so important. Absolutely. And we have a comment from Anastasia, who is in attendance as well on the chat. She has. Um, yeah. Can, can you share that with us, Anastasia? Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much. It's just a short comment. So I was educated in uh, North Wales, Bangor, and uh, now I'm back to my home country, which is Latvia. And Latvia is also a bilingual country. We have uh, Latvian, which is the official language, and Russian, which is the language of a very significant uh, uh, minority, I would say this way. And I have a comment which is related to the current political situation, because obviously we had a lot of Ukrainian refugees. What people don't realize is that most Ukrainians speak uh, Russian, and for quite a lot of them, they don't even speak Ukrainian because it's their second language. When we had these refugees in Latvia, uh, what they did be, is because of the political situation, they said, well, Russian language is going to traumatize them. So the kids who were placed in schools, they were taught surprisingly in Latvian. Uh, and now we have also Ukrainians in higher education and they're supposed to study in English. Well, unfortunately, I have been on the examination committee and they don't have good English. They're supposed to have B2. Most of them have A2 or B1, so they cannot really study in English. On the other hand, our lecturers have like mostly good Russian skills. They could have taught them in Russian. And I mean, in second, in like in schools for children, it would have been much easier to start in Russian schools in with, uh, with uh, tuition in Russian. And I think it's like, it's adding to the trauma because kids are taught in a language they totally don't understand. I have also seen cases where the, a girl who is sitting there, there is discussion in language, she's like, oh my goodness, what's going on? I mean, for somebody who, is, who has Slavic language is Latvian, it's not quite as well for an English person, but it's a very different language. It's not easy to, to learn, it takes time. So we need to sometimes to ask in, mm. which language we use and into which language we translate this. Yeah. We, we shouldn't assume. I mean, people assuming that people coming from Ukraine would be happy with Ukrainian. Unfortunately, they all not always are, even with Ukrainian. Absolutely. I think that's that's very helpful and very, very important, Anastasia. Thank you very much. Uh, it really shows the the complexity of, of the situations that, uh, that we face in this, um, in this role. Um, okay, I think um, we've come to the end of this very first uh, session. Uh, it's 10 past 10, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Susie, for uh, sharing your, uh, your experience, your expertise, your, your insights with us uh, this morning. Uh, very sorry that you'll not be able to stay for the rest of the of the morning but thank you very much for your time today thanks so much and i'm also so sorry i can't stay but thank you very much um okay fantastic so um we're going to uh, move on to the second part of uh, today's uh event uh, which focuses on the um uh, on the presentations uh by um uh, three experienced researchers uh, based in, uh, in Wales. 
Um, they are also uh, members of the uh, society's early career uh, researchers uh, network. So we're very uh, grateful uh, for their uh, time uh, today. I'm going to introduce each of the, I'm going to introduce the panelists um, in turn. So we're going to start with uh, 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 Dr. Ger Geraldine uh, Lublin. Uh, and her talk this morning. Uh, Geraldine is Associate Professor at Swansea University's Department of uh, Literature, Media and Language. She was born in Buenos Aires in Argentina and has lived in Wales since 2002. Uh, it was a Cardiff University School of Welsh that she completed her PhD, which focused on the special standing of the Welsh community in Chubut in relation to, uh, to, to the rest of Argentina. And this led her to de develop an interest in the wider, wider uh, dynamics of the region, including nation building in Argentina, indigenous populations and settler colonial theory. Geraldine is the author of the fabulous book, uh, Memoir and Identity in Welsh Patagonia, Voices from a Settle Settler Community in Argentina, which was published with Wales University Press in 2017, which uh, explored uh, autobiographical materials written by Welsh descendants towards the end of the 20th century. Uh, Geraldine's presentation uh, today is entitled Knowledge Production Across Borders, Insights and Challenges Arising from Collaborations with Argentine Researchers and Indigenous Communities in Patagonia. So thank you very much, Geraldine. Um, morning, everyone. Um, that it wasn't scripted, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, in this presentation, as Elena has said, I will share some insights and challenges arising from recent and ongoing projects co-created and conducted in collaboration with Argentine researchers and indigenous communities in Patagonia. One of these projects has a digital humanities profile and the other two are more traditional humanities research endeavors, as they are about reflecting on the occupation of Patagonia from the perspective of settler colonialism. I can say more about the projects themselves um, if there's time later on. So my research collaborators are based at the University of Buenos Aires' uh, Institute of Anthropological Sciences and at the University of Tierra del Fuego's Institute of Culture, Society and State. And it's worth mentioning that the projects I will be discussing today date back to 2018 and 2019. So they were put together in pre-pandemic times. So this is before what we could refer to as the explosion of collaboration with Global South researchers that the lockdown brought about. But more about this later. So the projects were conceived in conversation with my initial collaborator, Dr. Mariela Eva Rodriguez from the University of Buenos Aires, who has been working in collaboration with Tehuelche, Mapuche and Mapuche Tehuelche indigenous communities in what is today the province of Santa Cruz in Argentina for more than three decades. It's worth clarifying here that in the field of anthropology, collaboration is a technical term with very specific uh, meanings, as it implies co-theorizing or producing shared conceptualizations in the framework of what theorists call a dialogue of knowledges. More broadly, the collaborative paradigm urges researchers to open their research agendas to the interests and aims of the communities with whom they collaborate, and to engage in a truly dialogical process from the very inception until the final stages of the project. That is, if there ever, if there ever, ever are final stages, as it's usually the case, that the nature of these projects extends their duration far beyond initial assumptions. I hasten to say at this point that collaborative research methodologies are not new in Latin America. Rather, they became popular in the 1970s with Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and Orlando Files Borda's participatory action research methods. So as I was saying, both projects, um, or the three projects, were the result of ongoing dialogue between my collaborator, Mariela, and the indigenous communities with whom she has been working for a long time on the one hand, 
and between her and myself on the other. Since I applied for the funding from my end, I was down as PI, Principal Investigator, for um, uh, the two projects, the two main projects. But it was clear that they had been co-constructed. So in the case of the Digital Humanities Project, one of the other co-investigators, Dr. Simon Robinson, is also based at Swansea University, but he's in computer science. So given that the relatively more stable value of the pound <laughs> makes it makes UK funding less prone to depreciation than its Argentine counterpart, the Argentine peso, the awarding of the funds was very good news, of course. However, the financial aspects brought about its own complications. So on the one hand, the fact that I was officially the PI was relatively easily resolved in the sense that my collaborators and myself knew that Mariela, our local researcher, so to speak, was the one who had been working with the communities. So it made sense that her views would take priority over ours in some aspects if they were in conflict. So I'm happy to report that they were, there were no disagreements in the end. Um, but for me, it was clear that her deeper understanding of the context was impossible to disregard. Nevertheless, the fact that the funding was coming from the UK was more problematic than we had foreseen initially. On the one hand, many people around the world assume Britain is synonymous with England, and the memory of the Malvinas Falklands War hasn't faded in Argentina despite the 40 years elapsed since then. Um, so money from the English, as it were, was not necessarily welcome. And we found ourselves increasingly making the point that my university was in Wales and that Wales was not the same as England and so on. In addition, I have to confess that other aspects of my privileged positionality caused me to feel uncomfortable too. So, okay, I was Argentinian and that worked better than being Welsh or British or English, certainly. However, not only was I based in a UK university, I was also a porteña, <laughs> someone born in Argentina's capital city, Buenos Aires, and porteños are well known for being insufferably self-centered and deeply ignorant of the rest of the country, which we pedantically call the interior. So on top of it all, my pale skin and blue eyes were a strong hint of my European ancestry, which was also a significant factor. So I found myself apologetically justifying my presence at the various workshops. The fact that, as my collaborator Mariela used to point out, it was the money that I had secured which was enabling all of those activities to take place, didn't really make me feel any less comfortable any less uh, yeah any less comfortable indeed it was part of the problem if anything moreover it so happened that british money gave rise to specific suspicions in the patagonian context so if you forgive me for the very crude summary i'll try to explain the circumstances as briefly as possible so in the 20th century, nationalist Argentinian historiographers appropriated the by then supposedly extinct the Welche people as so-called Argentine Indians, quote unquote. So although such a claim goes against the recognition in the 1994 amendment to the national constitution that indigenous populations predate the Argentine state, many people still support that view today partly as a result of its dissemination via history textbooks and popular culture too, for decades and decades. So at the opposite extreme of the Argentine to Welche that this narrative proposes would be the so-called Chilean Mapuche, whose historical origins would be in the Andean region. So via a rationale that is difficult to explain to non-Argentinians, but makes perfect sense for many in the Southern Cone, England's long-standing interest in Patagonia materializes as support for the claims of the purportedly Chilean Mapuche to Eastern Patagonia. And they see confirmation of such claims in the fact that the headquarters of the NGO Mapuche International Link, 
um, are nowhere else but in Bristol. So though this argument uh, may seem far-fetched, an important political figure who was the Minister of Security about five years ago and is still very much around and sadly a plausible candidate to the presidency at the next general elections, has extended the alleged terrorist international links of the Mapuche to include this um, Kurdish groups and the Basque ETA separatist group too. So in this very particular context, it is understandable that British money paying for indigenous groups to reflect on and resist colonialism should ring alarm bells. Was a project meant to encourage anti-Argentine sentiment among indigenous populations so England could take advantage, advantage of that? And without the need to extend the paranoia to such extents, why would England or even the UK want to fund those research activities in Patagonia? What dubious schemes were behind all that? So although these circumstances may be seen as specific to the Patagonian context, they show us that as researchers, we need to be very aware of the elements at play. And sometimes that awareness doesn't prevent us from underestimating to what extent they may affect the planned research activities and influence the way knowledge is produced. So going back to collaborative research methodologies, whilst their merits are undeniable, it is difficult for them not to reproduce, at least to some extent, the wider asymmetric power relations containing them. And the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown these disparities into sharper relief for those of us working with the Global South. On the one hand, it has given rise to an unprecedented level of worldwide academic collaborations and pushed, us, pushed the boundary as to how knowledge may be produced. On the other hand, it seems to have brought about a reckoning among researchers in the global north that we aren't indispensable. I'm aware that this may sound controversial, but it's as if researchers in the global south had suddenly been discovered as such, and I use the word deliberately here. All of a sudden, we're invited to reconsider all the wasteful and environmentally harmful flying around, which used to happen almost without any questioning. While it's true that differently situated researchers see things in different way, and the richness is in the dialogue, we've come to appreciate that local researchers can contribute observations we wouldn't have been able to make following what is often relatively short-term fieldwork. Moreover, whether across disciplines or within them, the unforeseen acceleration of transnational collaborations that the pandemic brought about has taught us to value different perspectives and that has provided a welcome boost to interdisciplinary work. Nevertheless, the, despite the shift in research practices and a growing interest in decolonizing knowledge, not all North-South collaborations are conducted uh, conducted equ equitably, even when the themes of the projects themselves would suggest an awareness of power imbalances and even a will to change the status quo. As with the usual football derived metaphor in Latin America that refers to being the owner of the ball, in Spanish, ser el dueño de la pelota, it's, it's often the bringer of the funding who decides. And I've heard of transnational uh, collaborative projects where participating Latin American researchers have been told off because they do not operate in the same way as Europeans. So given that some research networks practice what they preach and, for example, insist on distributing research funding equitably instead of giving precedence to the PIs over the early career researchers or PGR postgraduate students, they can be told off by their Global North PIs as they don't tow the line regarding research practices in the North. Other uncomfortable questions remain in relation to how we may produce knowledge across borders. And I thought this would be an excellent opportunity to consider them together. As I mentioned before, the PI, principal investigator, co-investigator divide, 
can interfere with our good intentions. And it's not only about where the funding comes from. If projects are co-created, knowledge is co-produced and theorizations are generated in collaboration, shouldn't this extend to output authorship? Personally, I think it should, and yet this hasn't always been the case. And I guess collective authorship is not as beneficial in terms of metrics, not to mention, not to mention massaging, massaging the researcher's ego. Moreover, how may we avoid academic extractivism? How may authorship be extended to communities when research is truly collaborative? Although at times certain individuals have been more involved in the research process, naming some but not others may wreak havoc and create rifts within the communities that we're working with. And that certainly doesn't help further their interests. Moreover, the REF impact agenda in the UK is also problematic in that it encourages white saviorism. So for those of you outside the UK, I will explain that the UK's Research Excellence Framework, REF for short, is the system the UK uses in order to assess the quality of research in higher education. Uh, sorry, I've got an email. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah. um, in higher education institutions. The impact component accounts for 25% of the overall outcome awarded to submissions by so-called units of assessment and is defined as the effect on change or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services, health, the environment or quality of life beyond academia. So for case studies to score well, they need to demonstrate, and I quote, outstanding impacts in terms of their reach and significance, that end of quote, which really hoovers up all agency to concentrate it on the research, if not on the researchers themselves. So specifically, the kinds of phrasings expected in the impact game tend to undermine our endeavors to redress long-standing power imbalances relating to working with indigenous populations. Because genuinely collaborative projects would be aimed towards supporting communities in their own endeavors, rather than being seen to hold the magic key for something to happen, collaborative methodologies are not easy to reconcile with the impact imperatives. So, how may we co-produce knowledge across borders more equitably? How may we forge genuine partnerships whilst within the neoliberal academy and in the face of the growing corporatization of higher education? And specifically with regard to working with indigenous communities and other subalternized populations, how may we work together without replicating the unequal power relations and structural violence that our projects are attempting to address? So I'll be looking forward to discussing these and other uncomfortable questions with you later on. Thank you very much. Geraldine, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and also for sticking to time. Uh, each of our speakers um, has uh, 15 minutes, so I now turn to our colleague, Dr. Antonio Lloris, who will be our next, our next uh, speaker. Um, Antonio is reader in geography and director of the MSc in Environment and uh, Development at, um, is it Car sorry, I, I don't have it, it's Cardiff University, right, Antonio? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And um, he has coordinated uh, several projects on agribusiness frontiers, political ecology, and indigenous geography in South America. Among his recent books, uh, we can um, highlight Kaiocide, Living Through the Guarani Kiowa Genocide, published with Lexington Books in 2021. Frontier Making in the Amazon, Economic, Political and Socio-Ecological Conversion, 
published in 2020, and Agribusiness and the Neoliberal Food System in Brazil, Frontiers and Fishes in Agro-Neoliberalism, which came out with Routledge in 2017. So uh, a wide range of publications there that are very, very uh, relevant to our um, pan panel today. And Antonio's talk um, this morning is entitled Research, Ethics and Political Responsibility Beyond Mere Forms and Procedures. Thank you very much, Antonio. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to the organizers of this event, the Learn Society of Wales. It's wonderful to be here discussing such important issues and challenges. And I would like to acknowledge the participation of some people from Brazil who I invited, uh, some are, who, who are my research partners in several activities. Uh, there's a lot to say. We are dealing with very complicated and challenging issues. We just heard from Geraldine, uh, wonderful uh, reflections on, on, on uh, how to conduct research and a range of uh, uh, dilemmas that we all have. I'll, I'll also be talking based on my main research activities today, which are related to uh, indigenous peoples at the frontiers of development especially in South America, uh, these people who are kind of excluded or impacted, severely impacted by Western modernity, a very narrow, a very authoritarian type of modernity. Uh, when we talk about indigenous peoples, we are talking about around 475 million people. So it's quite significant. They are about 8% of uh, humanity. But much more than that, they have an incredible richness of experiences and knowledge and practices and lessons and uh, philosophy and science. So we, we are dealing with something incredibly important. And it's great that Wales, which is a small European country or, uh, who, and shared this island with three other nations, we are discussing and we are uh, trying to, to, to offer our contribution to this debate. I, I prepared some slides to help me to, to make sense of, uh, of what I want to, to discuss with you. Let's see if it works. I slightly changed the title, Elena, but it's basically the same idea. Uh, I, I want to make reference to these indigenous people uh, who live at the border between Brazil and Paraguay, the Guarani Kaiowa, uh, who right now are the indigenous people more severely affected by development, by agribusiness development. And in this book that Elena just described, I have the cover page in the next slide, I, I discuss what it seems quite contradictory, but uh, is, 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 is the reality, is a lived genocide. These people are living through an ongoing contemporary genocide. And that's my main interest to understand how, he, how, how much they have suffered, but also how, how uh, have they have been able to resist and to react to this ongoing genocide. Just to illustrate uh, what, uh, the situation, the, these uh, red dots are Guarani communities in South America. The Guarani is uh, one of the main, uh, uh, historically one of the main indigenous peoples in the lowlands of South America. So we have the Andes, people in the Andes, and people in the lowlands. And uh, historically, they occupy the Paraná, Paraguay, uh, Plata Basin, and they still these are these are uh, existing communities in 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 Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, and Bolivia. And this subgroup that I'm I'm involved with, the Guarani Kaiowa, they live uh, more or less in this uh, red circle. Uh, and it's it's quite a significant indigenous population. It's the largest indigenous population outside of the Amazon region in Brazil. And uh, what, they have been very lucky because they 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 they, they live in very fertile and rich, uh, a very fertile and rich region. But because of the quality of their soil, uh, their land has been grabbed and they have been expelled. They have been confined to tiny areas. This is to illustrate the fragmentation of uh, their, their uh, lands today. Most of these lands are uh, 
imaginary, are just a vision. These are the these are the main lands they are fighting for, on the Brazilian side. Uh, I have a new project dealing with the Paraguayan uh, experience, but I'm going to concentrate today on the Brazilian side. So they are they because of develop because of uh, nation building, they have been confined to small areas, and they are. Uh, uh, confronting the national state and confronting the power of agribusiness to try to recover at least these areas. This, if they recover one day, this will still be a small fraction of their original territory. So it's, it's an ongoing struggle, it's an, it's an ongoing geography of high octanage, high, high pressure. And because of that, obviously, they have tried to, to react and uh, their cause have attracted significant international attention. Uh, I just uh, illustrate here with two uh, recent articles from uh, one from the BBC, one from Le Monde in, in France. But uh, there, there's a lot being said about the Guarani Kaiwa. And uh, uh, that's what makes everything even more interesting. Uh, this, uh, this is the book uh, I just mentioned, and just some pictures of uh, uh, people reacting, people suffering, people. Uh, uh, reflecting and discussing their condition and establishing alliances with uh, other indigenous people and other sectors of national society. So there's a, not a lot to say, uh, but time is very limited. And I, I just want to, to focus on three aspects of, of uh, collaboration. Uh, and what I'm going to say is directly connected with what Susie, Susie is from the Welsh CIA, it's a, it's a bit, uh, it's a funny acronym, uh, but also with what Gerald Jean said. So I'm going to rely on what they just uh, explained and just present uh, my, my perspective. And I want to focus on three aspects of, uh, three difficult aspects of international collaboration, which is research ethics, method, and analysis of results. Uh, we all know that uh, ethics is a, is a hot topic in our universities. It's very much the case in, in Cardiff. It's very much the case in the School of Geography where I work. There is growing uh, uh, attention. That's, uh, the, we are now expected to fill lots and forms. And uh, it's, it's, it has become increase, increasingly, and I think, uh, worryingly bureaucratic. Uh, and I, I have had a, a number of discussions with my colleagues in the School of Geography. And I think we are kind of creating a monster. Because this ethical, uh, uh, this attention to ethics is very much about anonymity, is about avoiding harm to participants, which is, which is important, obviously. But how about political commitment? How about our positionality? How about uh, doing our research in relation to people who are already suffering uh, major impacts uh, and they have their life uh, disorganized and, and severely uh, uh, disrupted. So if, if ethics is just about method, it's, I think it's a very, very uh, uh, poor uh, consideration of ethic. Because ethic, ethics, in my mind, is much more about commitment, about political commitment. Uh, and the, 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 the direction of uh, uh, our, our ethic com committees and our ethic forms, I think it's, it's moving in, a, in, a, in, a, in the wrong direction and it's, co it's creating unnecessary problems. So my, my first observation is this. Uh, it's fine to, 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 to try to, to reduce impact, avoid impact, et cetera, but uh, we cannot uh, restrict ethics just to method just to data, but need to consider ethics in a much broader sense. That is connected with the discussion on multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity is just, not just about putting people from different disciplines, but it's about turning the table. It's about doing research in a different way. And that leads me to, to my second point. These are some pictures of my various field work campaigns and uh, several visits to the to the region meeting different communities and talking to different people and trying to do geography uh, on the ground as you saw that as you see that uh, so about about method it, it has been discussed today lots of important points about power asymmetries about 
funding, about uh, how to plan research, how to recruit, how to define impact. And I think that the answer to those very important questions, it has to be really the focus on the political dimension of research. We need to, to, to see uh, the, our, our, our uh, uh, partners, uh, the people we are engaging with as co-researchers, as uh, uh, real, real partners who we, with, with uh, whom we are going to, to learn together, we're going to reflect together. And that effort needs to be guided by the very perspective and the priorities of the people we are engaged with. It's not enough just to arrive that uh, parachute that with a, 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 a range of uh, uh, questions and methods and uh, fill forms and collect a huge number of uh, interviews uh, if we are not doing that in accordance with uh, their priorities, in accordance with their lived condition. Uh, I'm not going to expand because that's for another day, but in the last few years, I have been uh, uh, studying and really interested in Hegelian dialectics. And I think Hegel can help a lot here. Uh, Hegel, if, uh, uh, if we have a kind of enlightened reading of Hegel beyond the, the vulgar Hegelian dialectics can, can be of great help, uh, especially when Hegel talks about the particular and the universal, when it talks about consciousness and collective construction of consciousness. And F Hegel famously said, I that is we and we that is I. So uh, he Hegelian dialectics, I find lots of parallels and I'm writing a new book exactly on that. Uh, the traditional or the, 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 the accumulated knowledge of uh, the Guarani Kaiwa uh, in dialogue with uh, Hegelian dialectics uh, and the, the application of the, all that into a transformative research. My third and final point, and uh, I, I'm, I'm being very schematic here, uh, but just trying to, to convey the message, is about analysis of data. How, how we are going to process all that, uh, how we are going to make sense of this complex uh, social spatial reality with incredible power asymmetries and all that. And I think the key word here and South America has provided an incredible contribution to this debate is probably the, the main area in the planet where uh, such debates are taking place. The key word here is decolonize, decolonization, not just post-coloniality, but decoloniality, decolonization. We need to decolonize our language, we need to decolonize our analytical frameworks. Basically, we need to decolonize our mind. Each, each one of us will have his or her uh, baggage, influences, training, but it's incredibly important that we constantly challenge that. We, constant, we, we should be open to, 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 to reflection and to new I, ideas and do that in co collaboration with uh, uh, local academics but more important, those people we are engaged with. In this particular case, I'm very lucky because there is a growing number of indigenous academics. It's a new phenomenon, which is subverting the whole uh, you, uh, academic landscape. Uh, this man here on the top is uh, Eliel. He's now the director of the indigenous college there in the region. And he just finished his PhD in geography last year. I was in the PhD Viva to my, my great honor. And I think he's brilliant. Everything he writes, despite the fact that Portuguese is his second language, he, his, main, his first language is obviously Guarani. Uh, he's just an exa one example, a very important example of uh, indigenous academics who play this hybrid role, uh, and uh, which is difficult in, in many, many cases, but it's also uh, a, a very, very important new perspective. So we have local non-indigenous academics, the indigenous communities, but this uh, new, new, uh, uh, th those new agents, the indigenous academics themselves, and they have occupy and increasingly occupy an important space in uh, the, the regional universities, which is an, a very, very fascinating phenomenon that's happening now. And they help particularly 
uh, in this process of decolonization, how to reclaim modernity, how to subvert and reclaim modernity, have a, a different type of modernity, or, or even we can drop the, the, the concept altogether uh, and, and talk about uh, 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 something different. The, the, the indigenous peoples of, of the Americas from the North to the South America have insisted that the future is ancestral, that the, the indigenous uh, peoples of the Americas will play a very, very important role in the, in the, in the future, the, 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 the future of the history of each uh, country. And that is happening on the ground, that is happening uh, right now. They have been playing a very important role in national and local debates. There's also this expression facing East, because we, going from, from Western Europe, we are constantly facing West, from Europe to the Americas, facing West. But they have been reacting and, and, and using this expression. Now we need to face East as well. We, have a, we, we can play a very important role in uh, the debates about ourselves and the rest of national societies. And this effort of decolonization, in this effort, we can uh, benefit a lot from their knowledge. But we, we need to pay attention and need to, 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 to engage in a very meaningful uh, way to, to, to be able to fully grasp the, the, the richness of their ideas and their concepts and their science. In the case of the, the Guarani, one key concept is Tecoja. Tecoja is their territory, their land, where uh, which is a sacred land, uh, is the land of the family, and it's uh, one way to explain the Tecoja is is the land where we are, what we are, and and here we see a, a very interesting. Alice is attending this talk, one of my PhD students. We see geography in transformation. We see the enrichment of geography. So land, where we are, what we are. So in order to be what we are, we need the land, and that. That's what Antonio, uh, could I kindly ask you perhaps to uh, bring your uh, discussion to a close? Um, yes, yes. And yep. uh, thank you very much. Because as I said, there's a lot to say, but uh, I'm very obedient and I summarize my key points here exactly to facilitate that. So the three points I try to make are this, the, the need to see uh, 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 eth research ethics from a, from a, from a very, no for a, from a different angle beyond bureaucracy, beyond uh, reductionism to engage in concrete, meaningful ways with our object of study and conduct research according to their own priorities and to decolonize our language and our practices uh, in order to, to, to challenge and to reclaim modernity. Uh, this is just, uh, we, we, are all, we have several activities next year planned in the region. And I created this website last week, planning for, for, for the activity from the beginning of the year. Uh, most of it is still in Portuguese and Guarani, but I, I want to, to translate uh, the, the website as well uh, along the way. And just to finish with a very nice thought from the great French philosopher talking about the politics of space and how space is inherently political. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. Um, we're going to um, move uh, swiftly to Dr. Uh, Lucy Atala's uh, uh, talk. Um, thank you very much again, uh, Antonio. That was uh, such a such a toolkit you've uh, you've you've given us there uh, 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 to uh, to really go uh, deeply into the theoretical and methodological questions that occupy us today. And I do look forward to our discussion after uh, uh, Lucy's uh, talk. So um, Dr. Lucy Atala is a senior lecturer in anthropology at the University of Wales and a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Um, Lucy emphasizes the value of the humanities in generating ethical and innovative solutions that address current environmental and social problems in her work as the director of the UK's UNESCO Bridges Hub. Lucy has received the Green Gown Award for, for her inspirational contribution to sustainable education, and her research interests are underpinned by a focus on materialities, with specific attention afforded to water. She has explored water's part in organizing social behaviors in Kenya, Spain, and Wales, 
and her work in Kenya was supported by the Wenner Gren Foundation and was recognized by the United Nations for its environmental value. So we're very lucky to have uh, Lucy in attendance at our panel discussion today, and her presentation is entitled Building Bridges Between Knowledge Cultures. Thank you very much, Lucy. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me and for this opportunity, and of course to everyone here who's taken the time to come and listen. Um, so I haven't got a PowerPoint, sorry. Um, but you're just going to have to listen to me talking. Um, and I think my uh, contribution will build on what the previous speakers have said. And so, as Antonio said, you know, draw some of that knowledge through um, some of the points that the other speakers have made as I speak um, to sort of recognize that uh, all, all of these talks come together really beautifully. Um, actually, quite strangely beautifully, I think, so far. Um, so my presentation describes an indigenous-led land restoration or a revitalization project, which is about to begin in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia. Um, and the project is called Munek and Masha, which translates from the Kogi language as let it be reborn, let it be born or let it be reborn or let it emerge, that, that kind of sense of things. So on first inspection, this project looks to be simply a collaboration between Kogi people and academics, um, specifically anthropologists, environmental scientists and educationalists. Um, but it isn't quite that. In, in, in brief, in extraordinary brief, all I'm going to say is that um, the project alters the usual methods because it's the Kogi who've created the project, the Kogi who designed the project, and the Kogi who approached academics to say, come and work with us. We need to teach you how to heal and care for degraded land. So um, the Kogi are quite an interesting uh, group of people because they've kept their um, method secret from outsiders for about the last four or 500 years since Spanish conquest, when they uh, moved from the lowlands um, in their area up to higher up the mountain. They've basically stayed up there, um, you know, not exclusively. They have come down every now and again, but um, they've stayed up there and kept their methodology secret and haven't picked up what Antonio called modernity in his uh, presentation. You know, the, the methods of modernity, they they won't wear shoes, they still don't write, um, et cetera. There are other things that I could elaborate on, but I don't think I've got time, so I won't. Um, uh, what they have already shown individuals is that they can restore land very quickly. And so a, a previous project noticed a piece of land that they had, a piece of their ancestral territory that had been returned to them that was sort of degraded and ruined by farming and other development, and that they brought it back to life in a way that nobody quite understands how and it was restored rapidly so we don't know how people don't know how they they do this restoration and then in 2019 at just sort of before the pandemic hit they approached a uk charity and said um you know we want to set up this project um then the pandemic hit so we had lots of interactions over zoom um and uh, anyway, this project is, is now up and running. And this is because they've noticed that the, the glaciers above them and the land is behaving differently. So they recognize that from looking at the environment, that climate is, change is happening. And so they decided to show us how to nurse the land back to health, recognizing that as far as they're concerned, we're incapable. So sort of underneath all of this, there are some research aims hopefully to revolutionize conservation methods by teaching environmental scientists these indigenous methods. Um, but it's not just about being taught as well. As far as I'm concerned, the research explores how knowledge systems or knowledge cultures can work together, if at all. And therefore, I'm hoping that this research will be able to contribute to those debates that are associated with um, calls for scholarship to break out of their silos. So not just to draw in the muted voices from the global south and not just to 
um, work in interdisciplinary ways, but rather to find out how things can work together. Um, if indigenous conceptions of land management can be incorporated into conventional environmental methods, for example, they aren't typically because um, they're assumed to be based on sort of holistic philosophies rather than evidence, and they're usually discounted. Um, so, you know, this project questions that assumption. Um, you, you know, are these different methods incompatible? You know, that's one of the questions it's asking. And also, can different knowledge systems really work together? So not alongside each other, because we do this interdisciplinary thing a lot. We say, OK, we'll get some environmental scientists with artists or whatever, and we'll create some project. And look, we've done a lovely poster or whatever using this knowledge. But no, this is more about actually blending um, or, and to see whether these, these systems can kind of work together in that way. Um, and also to ask the question, what benefits come from blending knowledge cultures? So we know that cultures sort of hold on to their identity furiously. Um, you know, is it possible then to try and find ways to create what Geraldine called dialogue, proper dialogue uh, between these different ways of approaching the world? Um, and so to answer those questions, then we're using the methods of anthropology. Now, anthropology always assumes, anthropologists always assume that they don't know and that other people will teach them. So uh, the role of an anthropologist is to be taught, not to imagine they're the expert. So I think we come to this with a slightly different perspective to, to perhaps other disciplines. Um, and that the role of the anthropologist is to be taught by those people they're trying to understand, but also to reflect on their own biases sort of religiously throughout the process to find out if they are still imagining that they're you know certain things about individuals that perhaps aren't there um, and to allow you know it's a sort of humble position where you're led by these other individuals that you're trying to have relationships with and understand a bit more um, okay so to answer these questions then as I said um, uh, the methods of anthropology will be used to draw these indigenous populations and environmental scientists together um, to as the as the knowledge keepers of their cultures, if you like, to see if they can find synergies, but also to see what gets in the way of them finding synergies. Like what assumptions are they working for? And the the the, the aim of that, I suppose, is to generate some kind of novel solutions through this collaboration that maybe could be useful to the world. And a lot of this then comes on the back of this new UNESCO initiative that I'm part of directing, which is called UNESCO Bridges. Um, so that's an international venture. It's designed to champion transdisciplinary research uh, and education. Um, and actually, incidentally, it's seeking transdisciplinary projects to endorse. So come to me if you've got any. We'll see what we can do. Um, and, and that means really building bridges between these different ontologies, between uh, these different knowledge cultures, with a view to address today's really complicated uh, social and environmental pressures. Now, despite countless calls, I'm sure you're all, you know, sort of a bit bored of them really, for the, these calls for the walls of disciplines to dissolve and for disciplines to, uh, you know, find ways to collaborate. Disciplines still tend to be taught and delivered and understood as distinct as their own little cultures. Um, with their own methodologies and findings kind of linked to those discipline identities really clung on to furiously by everybody. And having those walls perpetuates these kind of knowledge hierarchies that Geraldine was talking about. It perpetuates a certain set of values, um, certain set of metrics, uh, almost a universalized notion of what constitutes robustness in terms of research. Um, and, and all of that means everything is kind of constructed through those frameworks. And of course, indigenous skill holders or experts see the world very differently and don't fit into those kinds of frameworks. And so therefore are discounted. And in fact, are very rarely brought in as experts. So, you know, uh, to, uh, 
hopefully bridges what bridges is unesco bridges is, ho is hoping to do is hopefully find ways to kind of tackle that exclusivity and to make things more inclusive in terms of knowledge production so to get back to the project then muneka masha is going to challenge some of those i hope uh, those ontological assumptions and maybe turn things on their heads to invert the usual um, hierarchies um, you know, those things that typically discount indigenous ideas as sort of fascinating or exotic or cute or quaint in some way, um, to, uh, to recognize that there's not just different approaches to life need to coexist, okay? So not just run alongside each other, but more radically than that, I'm hoping, that there is not just one world um, you know, or one nature. There are many worlds, and we need to understand about those many worlds. Um, and, and perhaps a more interesting emergent question that comes from that is what happens to knowledge if one accepts that there are multiple truths emerging from these multiple natures? So if, you know, accepting this notion requires an enormous epistemological shift, enormous. Uh, you know, to an inclusive shift that allows all of these different ways of seeing the world to exist simultaneously and offers research initiatives, I think, a very interesting kind of edge because it really directly challenges the axiomatic, uh, you know, idea that we all hold to that cultures differ, but nature does not. So this is really complicated stuff. Uh, and I think there are enough in ethnographies, you know, maybe some of you have read them, that show that people know and think about the world utterly differently. You know, the, the meaning of life, what a tree is, who's a, relevant, who's a relative, for example, what it means to be human and so on, are understood completely differently depending on where you're from, despite the dominance of Euro-American ideas around the world. So the ontological turn then here, with the, with, which we're playing with, I suppose, is asks, what if researchers stop translating others' ideas and simply state them as fact? What happens to knowing, what happens to knowledge, if other people's ideas are held as true? Really challenging, really complicated. And I'm sure that all of your minds are going, what? Shut up, <laughs> immediately. But, but perhaps also apposite, you know, at a time when there is a dominance of approaches that demand a particular kind of perspective, um, you know, it, it, there's a kind of stranglehold, if you like, on the ways that researchers can research and who is a researcher at all, which is something that um, Geraldine mentioned uh, very usefully, I think, to all of us. So let's go uh, back then to have a quick look at the project, the local context. Um, as I've said, it's in um, Santa Marta, in, in Colombia, uh, the, uh, where the Sierra Nevada is. And Sierra is one of the highest coastal massive mountains um, with important biodiversity. Um, it's got historical and cultural legacies, which are now recognized by the Colombian legislation. Um, and that a lot of the territory that's been put over to development and to farming is actually um, belongs to the indigenous populations of which there are four in the area. Um, what the activities of the global north, just to put it, you know, briefly, a bit inaccurately, but briefly, um, uh, means that the Sierra's water supply is now really challenged and um in fact it, it, in 2019 it was declared a state of emergency and and drinking water had to be bussed in by the truckload um now the solutions that are being uh thought of you know um cha championed in that area um engage those kind of conventional methodologies that mirror the global north you know gray infrastructure that kind of thing and all of the developers are overlooking the ancient methods uh, that, and according to the indigenous populations, what's happening there is going to accelerate, not solve this environmental degradation. So you can see then why I feel this project is very important because it may make a difference, not just to that area, but to other places around the world too, who are suffering similarly. So my work in Kenya showed that there's a lot, there's you know, North Kenya is suffering terribly from drought, as I'm sure you're all aware. 
Um, so from an indigenous perspective, the Kogi understand the world as a living body and any tears to the fabric upset the balance and the health of the territory. Now, I'm sure all of you are immediately thinking, oh yes, that's lovely, but that doesn't really help anything. Well, that's what this project is going to find out. What does happen if we take on board those ideas? What would happen? How would landscape management and ecological projects change if they take if one took on board those ideas? Um, and for the Kogi, there are multiple factors locally that have torn the fabric of the territory and making it disconnected from the other places that feed it you know, mining, industrial, agriculture, something that Antonio was mentioning. And of course, the fact that they can't access places to heal the land as it gets hurt. So for the Kogi, well, in fact, the Kogi are utterly cognizant that the local context reflects a wider problem affecting the entire planet. And they too are similarly mindful that there's a historic disregard for indigenous philosophies and that the dominant position in the world favors particular methods you know on the global stage so consequently the kogi then sent this message well they've sent messages out to the world since the 1990s saying there's something wrong better stop um, nobody's listened so they've finally come up with this new initiative to find a way to redress this intellectual imbalance that constantly discounts what they say is sort of unsophisticated or quaint in some way. And they've decided to achieve this through direct action. Um, to put their methods to academic scrutiny, and I've got to say they are very much in charge of this process and are the people who have, uh, you know, as I said earlier, sort of designed it and come up with what you know, I should do to help them uh, get their message out. So they've chosen the academics that they want to work with. They had to meet the environmental scientists and agree through spiritual practices that they were the right people to work with and so on. So the whole team um, and the design of everything, you know, revolves around their calendar and their um, ideas of, of correct practice. So the project's been initiated by spiritual elders um, and hopefully by the end of it, you know, with all these vetted academics, uh, the, we will learn, record and evaluate their methods. So we do need to evaluate their methods. You know, this again chimes back to what Geraldine was saying, um, that uh, we are kind of stuck in, in, a, in a methodology, in a, in a way of approaching things, but uh, hopefully regardless of that we will come up with something interesting and create free downloadable open access um, activity models for people to do what the kogi do around the world i hope i've kept time i tried to speak really fast did i yeah that was brilliant thank, thank you Sarah. thank you Lucy. <laughs> thank you very much no problem fantastic well thank you all thank you uh to our uh, three uh, panelists today and uh, we have um around 15 minutes now for questions and debates uh and i can see that there's been a lot of um a lot of comments in the in in the chat so yeah we have a a, a question to uh to antonio from aline albuquerque um i would like to know how do you see the participation of indigenous people in policy for example now we have in brazil a lot of indigenous representatives elected to political positions Absolutely. and i presume this is perhaps also the context in colombia as well with the new uh with the new uh, politics as well in government in chile as well and many other countries yes i think that's that's a very important phenomenon and it's ultimately going to help the rest of global society to address its problems not just the the, the problems the, the indigenous are suffering but they have a lot to contribute because they are increasingly agents of their own geography. It's a, it's a power struggle. It's obviously a political game. But uh, these people, because of their knowledge, their strategies, their uh, practices, they have been able to, to influence more and more, resist and influence 
uh, what's happening to them and, and elsewhere in the rest of the country and the world. So I think it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Right now in Brazil, after the election last week, uh, a new ministry, the Ministry of the Ancestral Peoples, will be created. And that will be a historical achievement by the new uh, democratic government. So it's it's very, very interesting. And this is a, it's a phenomenon that we need to uh, pay very close attention. Because as Lucy said, <clears throat> they have such precious knowledge. They have such a wonderful and, and very, very valuable uh, experience going back centuries and sometimes even longer than that. Uh, and they cherish and value that uh, and they should because it's very, very precious. Uh, and only through a dialogue, only through through a, a, an honest dialogue that that's possible to 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 incorporate and, and access that. There was a, an observation earlier, Elena, just to to address about decolonization by Anastasia. Uh, 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 decolonization is a process. It cannot be done unilaterally. It cannot be just something that we decide we now become decolonized. It's, it's a process, and it's ultimately about engaging in these power disputes and about understanding our positionality, our biases, and uh, having this horizontal, honest, genuine uh, collaboration with uh, uh, local academics beyond uh, Europe and also uh, communities that we are engaging with. Any other questions? Yep, by Jessica. Um, I'll read out Jessica McLean's question first, and then uh, there's another one by Sarah Oaks. Um, well, or, or maybe, I mean, maybe um, Lucy, you can also see yourself. Uh, um, she loved your paper, particularly centering indigenous knowledge holders' voices as the experts they are. Is there a way to subvert the evaluation process to help the academic community understand indigenous sovereignty and agency? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of your question is actually something that Geraldine uh, mentioned, and thankfully, then I didn't have to do it because she'd done it already when she was, and she did it brilliantly. Um, that That's an ongoing process. So in terms of the, the Munyaka Masha project that I'm involved with currently, um, the Kogi will be the people who create the outputs. So the main at well apart from the obvious academic papers that we all you know sort of go around and do they will be the individuals who create the um the activity model that we're going to disseminate um everything has to be done in discussion with them in fact no no choices can happen without that but i do think they're very unusual in that way they've they've sort of had enough of what we're doing to the world and they've decided it's time to step in so it's quite unusual um so that evaluation process will work like this the hard scientists are going to measure the changes in the environment as they revitalize a piece of land but the kogi will do exactly the same so they're going to do they're going to have different metrics to measure what constitutes health and to look for which changes indicate what. So the role of the anthropologists will be to almost uh, join those two different ways of seeing the world together. And the activity model will do just that. Um, will allow, hopefully, there to be a kind of synergy between these methods rather than having them as separate and as oppositionals to find a way to sort of blend them together so it's going to be difficult but when the hard scientists say oh this species has grown or this change has occurred that will be taken as one approach whereas what the kogi say well actually we're looking for changes here and this is what we see as change this is environmental health indicator you know this is the bio indicator we're looking for we'll have to try and find ways to, through extensive discussion in the field together with the elders, with the spiritual leaders, with the practitioners and with the scientists, to find a way to get all of that to gel together. D does that answer your question? Maybe. 
Yeah, no, fantastic. Uh, uh, there's, there's another one for you, I'm afraid, uh, uh, Lucy, by Sarah, by Sarah Oakes, um, uh, a series of them. Um, she says that you've mentioned that the indigenous communities themselves decided to put their methods to academic scrutiny. Have the methods of academic scrutiny been discussed? And also, how was it decided to put methods under academic scrutiny? Um, so what <laughs> methods were used to discuss this and decide upon this as a focus? Or did this include you or did they approach you independently with this request? They approached a UK based charity independently who got in touch with me as, well, I, I'm somebody who's worked with that charity before, as somebody who has expertise in water. So um, the whole point is about bringing water back to the environment. Um, and uh, from that, uh, we had 18 months of discussions with the Kogi um, about what they wanted we made suggestions about what was possible. They rejected that. They said they wanted this. They wanted, you know, they 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 were very clear. Um, they're very articulate. Um, they they have a, a strength and a confidence. They actually forgive me, but they cut through academic shit very quickly. <laughs> forgive my French. Um, <laughs> and it's been absolutely inspirational to. Um, work with them so far, even just in the development stage, because the um, they reflect back a picture of what we say, what I say, even sometimes that makes you feel a bit like, oh my word, okay, yeah, good, I need to learn this. So it's the the process is reflective and reflexive in that one's own biases, one's own issues, like, for example, work, working with the research officer, putting the research bid in, you know, I had to be very careful. This is this is going back to what Geraldine was saying. Uh, you know, I'm the PI, but really, I'm not in charge. <laughs> you know, this is an administrative nonsense. So there's still a lot of work to do. And, and I have to keep pushing back at people who keep saying, oh, scientists are going to learn something. And I'm like, no, shush, <laughs> that's not the main point here. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. I, I, have, I, have I answered your question about scrutiny? Um, basically, the Kogi are leading pretty much everything. Um, money's part of it. Well, they want the money. Honestly, um, they're quite clear they want to buy their ancestral lands back. And so, you know, yeah, sure, use this money. <laughs> it was taken from them some time ago, so it seems fair. Yeah. Yeah. Enough of me. Talk to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, um, there's a question uh, from Barbara to, to Geraldine. Uh, because uh, you mentioned the context for the research um, evaluation we have in the UK, the REF, and um, Barbara is asking, do you have any practical tips on how to engage with the REF and address the bias on the impact component? Big question. We've all wanted this at some point or other in our careers in the UK. <laughs> yeah, I think I have no practical <laughs> suggestions. I think it's, as Susie was saying, it's about constantly ch challenging ourselves um to and 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 question whether uh what we are doing is aligned with our values and our original <laughs> motivation to do the project but we also it would be dishonest for us not to um admit that we need to play the game because we need to keep our jobs as well so it's 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 about striking a balance and um and i was i was thinking about this lucy because the 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 this um this academic scrutiny is instantly assuming a hierarchy of knowledge but it's the game we need to play and um <laughs> so I, I I do think I, I I was in charge of the ref submission for my unit and and so I can't get rid of that impact thing that we are supposed to demonstrate how we are personally our research is saving the world and the work we do with indigenous communities is 
the opposite of that. We're trying to subvert that while still trying to play the game, keep our jobs and shift resources and use the power imbalances to benefit our communities. So um, my um, response, I guess, is no, I don't know. <laughs> And yeah, it was a brilliant answer, Geraldine. Well done. Um, <laughs> we, we're, this is a new path we're treading, isn't it? This is, you know, we're, um, you know, we're walking tentatively in the dark, I suppose. Although there's been lots of co-authorship, so this is to address Jessica's question in the chat. There's been lots of co-authorship done in anthropology, and I'm sorry, I only know about anthropology really. Um, uh, to you know, deal with some of those power imbalances. In terms of the Muneka Masha project, the Kogi will retain everything. Um, now that that's uh, sort of slightly problematized by the fact that the university also believes that it will have some ownership over me um, and what I produce. Um, but if the Kogi instruct me on what they want me to say, then you know, I'm sort of more their mouthpiece than me, as it were. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these are very complicated. And when I, you know, speaking with the Kogi, they're utterly aware of this transactional uh, nature of this, that they have come to us, that they want something from us, but also we have to have something back again. So that it's not, um, you know, that's a level playing field rather than a hierarchy. You know, they're very open about it that yes if you if you if you make an impact in one area there will be a change somewhere else so all of this is sort of spoken about in those terms with them mm. brilliant i think we have time for one more question uh, before we bring our session to a close um yeah, there's a comment there, uh, very opposite by uh, Anastasia, with regards to censorship, I suppose, with the, with you know, with regard to the, the to the frames and the institutional frames in which we do our research. And Sarah as well has uh, another question: Are things changing in terms of consideration of indigenous knowledge by international decision or policy makers? Does it matter what format this knowledge appears in? Does it have to appear in Western formats like peer reviewed journal articles and policy briefs to be considered valid? And I, and I guess this relates again to the question of the, the REF as, a, as, a, as an institutional framework there as well that we have um, in the UK. I've got to say, these are fantastic questions. What a group. And mm. you know, usually you can go to things and you can sort of nod off a bit, but this one, no, we're all awake, aren't we? It's fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of questions there, and obviously we don't have very much time to answer them. I feel as if, um, you know, a lot of that's all of the policy makers policy making. It's really ideological. It's it you know it's based on what funding opportunities come up. It, it's based on all sorts of things. It's a huge discussion. Um, mm. Positionality. April anthropologists come from that from the outset constantly looking at their own position have to otherwise we couldn't do the job so yeah always yeah there was an observation about positionality i totally agree with lucy it's, it's crucial that we constantly ask ourselves about our training our baggage our commitments our uh the demands and certainly we are under pressure uh in the UK, we are becoming more and more proletar uh, proletarian of, 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 of the university, uh, but we, we also have uh, to, to con constantly consider when we go abroad, uh, what we are bringing and, and our, our language, our perspectives, uh, and is, is, a, is a constant uh, uh, learning process, constant, uh, constant uh, questioning process, uh, endless really because we are just human and we have our limits, our, our influences. But it's mm. certainly very, very important that we, we, we ask that, we constantly question that together with our, our partners on the field. Yeah, and Geraldine, 
you have a comment? Yeah, sorry, Elena, I'm very conscious of time, but just one thing, one um, observation, so we, we won't have time to answer all the questions, but just one reflection about um, collective authorship. So we generously share the authorship of our outputs with the communities we work with, but in my experience, that is also the source of problems because we essentialize these communities as one um, group and there's disagreement, there are rifts um, within these communities and sometimes so you can't co-author uh, an output with the whole of the community because that author doesn't really exist. And then if you go for individuals, I tried to say this very quickly in my, in my presentation, so if you go for individuals that makes things worse because it actually um, shifts power <laughs> in the wrong way and so it becomes a problem um so just just to add to the the the, the complicated questions really yeah and it's worth noting that indigenous communities are all different so they have different governance and power structures and different understandings of who can speak and who can't and they will you know they will respond to uh, these kind of questions in very different ways. So yeah. another complication. Yeah, fantastic. Well, can I uh, thank you all for um, for producing such such an important and, and, and such a pithy, I think, a panel discussion we've 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 had this morning. You've given us uh, you've been so generous and uh, frank and critical, and I think um, you know we have been able uh, to have a very, uh, very meaningful discussion about uh, issues that are very, very um, close to what we do as researchers on this sort of intercultural uh, phase. So thank you very much as well, Barbara and Kathy, of course, for organizing uh, this this panel, and to every one of you who Fred. Who registered and has been in attendance and has contributed to the to the discussions. Uh, so I think uh, that will be it for now, unless Barbara or Kathy want to say a final word of thanks. Thank you all. Yeah, the uh, Oxfordy uh, and and Beth and Popeth. Uh, so yeah, please thank you so much for the panel. It has been a really really good uh, talk. I uh, just encourage everybody who's here, um, let us know. Don't forget that we're going to be sharing a, uh, a feedback form. We'd love to hear from you. And also uh, do you know, keep in contact. We'd like to be able to, to share with emails with each other. So let us know if that's possible. If there's anybody uh, you're interested, please put your email here. So uh, thank you so much to, again to the speakers. It's been really great. So have a, a great rest of the day as well. Thank you. <laughs>